Good morning to all and welcome to our Christmas celebration here at Shepherd of the Plains. We turn to the opening litany. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To us a child is born. To us a son is given. From the fullness of his grace we have received one blessing after another. In our congregational carol, O Come All Ye Faithful. Our iniquities have separated us from God. Our sins have hidden his face from us so that he will not hear. We look for light, but all is darkness. We look for brightness, but we walk in deep shadows. We look for deliverance, but it is far away. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful 
and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be proclaimed. Almighty God, grant that the birth of your one and only Son in the flesh may set us free from our old bondage under the yoke of sin. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In our epistle lesson for Christmas, we are reminded that Christmas is not just one day in our life. Rather, it is a way of life. Living Christmas. For the grace that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. And we'll join together in the verse of the day. Alleluia. When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under the law. Alleluia. And we rise for the Christmas gospel. As I mentioned in the notes, one of the grandest chapters in Scripture. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him was nothing made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives birth to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the gospel of Christ. Be to God. 
Please be seated. We continue with our carol, Gentle Mary Laid Her Child. The Green Pastures is the name of a Pulitzer Prize winning play. It was written by a man by the name of Mark Conley way back in 1930. And the play centers around Old Testament Bible stories, all Old Testament Bible stories. There is one twist, though, in this play. All of the characters in the play, including God himself, are African-American, and they all speak with a southern accent. And in the closing scene of the play, there is a conversation between God and the angel Gabriel. And the Lord is anxiously looking out over the ramparts of heaven, and he is looking at the sinful situation down on earth below. And Gabriel is sitting there as he's having this conversation with God, and he has a trumpet stuck under his arm, right? He has a trumpet stuck under his arm, and kind of sensing God's dilemma as he's overlooking everything which is going on on earth. He says, Lord, is it time for me to sound the trumpet? No, no, no. The Lord looks at Gabriel. Don't touch that trumpet. Not yet. He continues, the Lord does, to look down on the world below and what can happen. And then Gabriel suggests to the Lord, maybe, Lord, you should send someone to intervene. Maybe someone like Abraham again or Moses again. Or maybe you should send one of the Old Testament prophets. How about Isaiah or Jeremiah. And the Lord answers this way, this time I am not sending anyone else. This time I am going myself. Isn't that a great play? Isn't that a wonderful story, right? 
won the Pulitzer Prize. What a story, right? This time I'm not sending anyone else. This time I'm going myself. It's not a play. It's not a story. It's Christmas, right? It is God's simple yet brilliant plan. And we read these words, hear these words from Isaiah. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. What did God see on his own? When God looked down, he saw a mess. And it wasn't a mess that he made. It was a mess that mankind made. When God looked down, this original plan was perfect. Everything about the universe, everything about the world, the climate, the landscape, everything about it was perfect. And everything about his created beings, about Adam and Eve, was perfect. Their relationship with God was perfect. Their relationship with each other was perfect. Since God didn't create the mess that we still live in today, what does that mean? It means that someone else did. I read a story about a little girl who was given a tea set for Christmas. And, of course, she had to have a tea party. And she had a tea party with dad. And dad really hammed it up. He said, oh, honey, you know, sat with her. This tea is just, it's just so good. Can I have another cup? And she goes and gets dad another cup of tea. And about that time, his wife comes in. She's kind of smiling. She said, has it ever occurred to you that the only place she's tall enough to get the water from is from the toilet. <laughs> Dumb things we sometimes do. But nothing was dumber than what Adam and Eve did, right? Two highly intelligent people. How could two highly intelligent people be so dumb? Well, the answer is surprising. The answer is love. You heard it right, love. Not love for God, but love for themselves. They put love for themselves above their love for God. That was so dumb. And in doing so, they ruined this world and everything in it for themselves and everyone else. They ruined our world our relationship with God was ruined. Our lives were ruined. Our futures were ruined. And so God, what? He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. When Isaiah speaks of intervening here, he's referring, he is referring to restoring these ruined relationships. First, how about restoring the ruined relationships that we have with people? The year 1900, told you this, some of this before in a Bible class. In the year 1900, that was the first year the population of the world reached a billion people. And today, in 2021, the population of the world is over 7 billion people. And by most estimates, the population of the world in just 20 years, in the year 2040, will be over 10 billion people. That's a lot of people. And people don't always get along. Last Monday, I picked Marie up from the Lubbock airport, and it was the busiest I'd seen the airport. Lots of people coming in to be home for the holidays. Right? Everyone is excited to be home for the holidays. Can't wait to be home for Christmas. And then 
it comes. And mom leaves the turkey in the oven too long and it's dry. Dad isn't happy with his gift. Uncle Joe has one too many beers. And the grandkids are just driving you crazy. And they would never, ever, ever say it, but those people who couldn't wait to get to Lubbock for Christmas are saying, I can't wait to get out of Lubbock for Christmas. That's how it is in relationships, right? In our relationships with people, it sometimes just goes south. And the result, there's guilt in the world, there's divorce in the world, there's wars in the world, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. And what does God say? There is no one to intervene. We can't do a thing about it. We can't do a thing about it. And then what about our relationship with the Lord? Restoring that ruined relationship. Last year, I picked Marie up at another airport around the holidays, and it was the airport in El Paso. And so you drive, we were serving a vacancy in Las Cruces, drove to El Paso. And as you're driving through El Paso, you can't help but notice something. It's rather intimidating. And what you can't help but notice is the wall. There's the wall. And on one side of the wall, there is unbelievable freedom and blessings and privileges and wealth. And then on the other side of the wall is unbelievable poverty, abject, abject poverty. It, of course, is the wall that separates El Paso from Juarez, New Mexico. And that wall symbolizes our relationship with God. There is just no way we can do anything with God because of a wall, a wall that stands in the way. And the wall that stands in the way between us and God is very simple, it is our sin. And sin makes a ruin and causes rifts in our lives. And especially in our relationship with God, there is guilt, and then there's death, and there's damnation. And we can't climb over that wall, we can't dig under that wall, we can't tear that wall down on ourselves. There is nothing that we can do. There is no one to intervene. Well, with no one to intervene, God made the decision. This time, I'm going myself. And this is what God did on his own. So his own arm achieved salvation for him. And his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head he put on garments, the garments of vengeance, and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. I want to speak to you about another wall, and many of you might not even remember this wall. It was a wall that separated oppression from freedom. On one side of the wall, people were basically captives, and on the other side of the wall, they were free. And this wall was built as a result of what was called the Cold War. And it was the Berlin Wall dividing East Germany, excuse me, East Berlin from West Berlin. It was built by the communists in 1961. Two years later, after that wall was built, 1963, President John Kennedy stood right near that wall. And he made a very famous speech, one of the most famous speeches of his very short presidency. And in that speech, he said, Ich bin ein 
Berliner. And that means I am a Berliner. That was Kennedy's way of saying to the people of Germany, West Germany and West Berlin, I am here with you. My country is here with you. We support you in everything we do. Now, he wasn't there to be around when it happened, but 26 years after Kennedy said those words, that wall came down. On Christmas Eve, God intervened and became one of us. He could just as well have said, I am a human being. I am one of you. And not only am I one of you, am I a human being, but I am also true God. And 33 years later, what happened to that wall? It came tumbling down. Not because of anything that we did, but because of everything that Jesus did for us. And here is how that wall of sin came tumbling down. Why isn't it... Uh, Just need a. It's just a. There we go. This is how God brought the wall down. Again, we see the words He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on His head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped Himself in zeal as a cloak. We're good. You can just leave it like that. You can just leave it on there. Yeah, so we're good. All right, it says he put on his righteousness as a breastplate. Righteousness can be taken two ways. Righteousness can be a very intimidating word. Righteousness can also be a very comforting word. Righteousness is what God demands of us in keeping with his holy law. God demands perfection. That's what righteousness is. From womb to tomb, from the time we're born to the moment we die. And he demands righteousness in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. Did any of you have any bad thoughts this past week? For any of you, did any bad words come out of your mouth. Any sinful actions, were any of you perfect this past week? I was, and I'm not kidding. I was perfect. No bad thoughts, no bad words, no bad actions. I met God's demand. I will meet God's demand from womb to tomb. I am righteous. I am perfect because I am baptized. And through my baptism, I am attached to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what's true of me is also true of you. Through baptism, you're attached to what Jesus did, how he intervened, and we are right with God, righteous. Next, the helmet of salvation on his head. Salvation is forgiveness, new life, the promise of eternal life. It's every blessing that we have in our lives through everything that Jesus has done for us. And how did he do that? On the cross, Jesus crushed the serpent's uncovered head and he crushed our guilt, 
He crushed our death. He crushed our damnation. He put on the garments of vengeance. Jesus not only intervened with us with his life and death in the past, but he continues to intervene for us every single day. When life is scary, and sometimes it is, he is there to protect us. When life is a battle, and sometimes it is, he is there to battle for us. The baby in the manger, in the crib. The Savior on the cross. The King of kings in heaven, wearing his crown. What did he promise you? Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And then he wrapped himself in zeal, as in a cloak. Filled with the gospel, we have that same zeal. As we forgive those who hurt us, as we reach out to those who are helpless and are hurting, as we offer comfort and hope to the comfortless and to the hopeless. You may have noticed it by now, but if you open your service folder, you have either a Christmas gift, and everybody take that out, or you have a lump of coal. Don't start getting snotty about this. <laughs> Who has a Christmas gift? Who has a lump of coal? Okay, I, I want those of you who have the Christmas gift to exchange that Christmas gift for a lump of coal with someone who has a lump of coal. I have a lump of coal. I'll take your lump of coal. Thank you, Kurt. Those of you who exchanged the gift, way to go. And those of you who had a lump of coal, but now have a gift, say thank you. Thank you. I am not sending anyone else. This time, I'm going myself. What we just did now is exactly what God did for us. He wasn't going to send anyone else. He sent himself. All we deserved was the lump of coal. And in love and grace, he gave us the Christmas gift, the greatest Christmas gift ever. He gave us himself. He gave us the promise of everlasting life. He gave us the hope and joy with which we now live our lives every day. Jesus died to give us life. And when all is said and done, that's really what Christmas is all about. We'll now join in the confession of faith. Oh no, first we'll sing a Christmas carol. We'll sing, now sing we now rejoice.
doing things a little backwards today, but that's okay. Now we are going to join in the confession of faith. It's a portion of the Athanasian Creed, and the Athanasian Creed is that really long creed that some churches use on Trinity Sunday. We'll be using a portion of that for this Christmas celebration, and it focuses especially on Jesus, his person, and his work. Now this is the true now, this is the true Christian faith. We believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, is both God and man. He is God, eternally begotten from the nature of the Father, and he is man, born in time from the nature of his mother, fully God, fully man, with soul and body. Equal to the Father as to his deity, less than the Father as and though he is both God and man, Christ is not two persons, but one. One, not by changing the deity into flesh, but by taking the humanity into God. One indeed, not by mixture of the natures, but by unity in one person. For just as the soul and flesh are one human being, so God and man are one in Christ. He suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose the third day from the dead. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. This is the true Christian faith. And the exhortation. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorified and praising God And we receive the blessing from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. And we'll rise for our closing carol, Angels We Have Heard on High.
again, everyone. Very Welcome to our guests. Great to have you with us today. Just a couple of things from there. I mentioned that there. Thank you so much for the Christmas gift that you gave us. Uh, boy, beyond generous. That was really, really nice of you. We appreciate that a lot. You might have to do it to fix the organ. <laughs> no, Peter just can't leave. <laughs> Also, I want to thank a lady who, uh, we see these people like Brad and all of them, and everybody who helps with here, um, but I want to give a special shout out to Lila Matine. She's been a tremendous help to me, and I hope she's watching and that she sees this, uh, because she's the one who puts together the PowerPoint. I sent her what I call a service folder, and she does the PowerPoint. So I appreciate that, and I hope all of you do as well. She does a really great job at that. Never any spelling mistakes. It's incredible. Once, which I, because I don't know it. And um, again, next week, uh, topic, the four seeds of biblical history for uh, our Bible class, creation, corruption, catastrophe, and Christ. Um, anything else? I think it's time for church to be over, right? <laughs> kids always give you the cue. It's great hearing kids. You must not go. <laughs>